Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. On all of Johann Sebastian Bach's music, you will find three letters. S, D, G. Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. In these words, we see his attitude towards his music. One of the greatest musicians of all time didn't want credit for the lyrics or the songs or the composition or the conducting that he had in his life. No, all of it was to be dedicated to God's glory, to his work. This is a a fulfillment, a a demonstration of what you get in Ephesians chapter uh, chapter 2, verse 10 where we read, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So how and when is God glorified? Is he glorified in music? I know that churches are built, and quite often there is a stone of dedication that is put in the corner that have the words dedicated to the glory of God. There are church constitutions where in the founding documents of the church, they will say that they exist to the glory of God. So let me ask you, when and how is God glorified? Is he glorified in music or in a building or in a church? And the answer is, Yes. But understand this. God is not most glorified in what we can offer to God, but rather in his work for us and in our midst. God is glorified in music when it proclaims what Jesus Christ has done for us. God is proclaimed in a building when this place is set aside to proclaim his work in this world his salvation that he has won by Christ's death on the cross. And congregations, when Christians live together in unity as brothers and sisters, and you know that brothers and sisters do not always agree with each other, but they're forced to stick together because they're family. Well, we are united in Christ, bound together together, And when we exist as a congregation, God is glorified. About 13 years ago, when I was here, we were starting to look at finances and wondering what God was doing, how we would make this work. And one day we asked the question and played a worst-case scenario, and I said, what's the worst thing that happens if we don't have enough money, if this venture falls apart? And the answer is is that the members would have to go to church in town. They would have to drive an extra half an hour each way. That they would have more difficulties because of it. That they would, well, lose some of their community and their friends. And I, well, I'd have to go serve another church. But really, if that's the worst case scenario, what were we so afraid of? And then on the other hand, I ask this question. What is the benefit of us existing as a congregation? And the answer is that we exist to the glory of God. That we continue to proclaim Christ and his mercies, not just in this place, but to our community that others may know of the love of God in Christ Jesus, that he calls us to repentance, and that our lives would give glory to God, to our friends and our families, that others may know the saving work of God. This is how God is glorified. Paul writes to the Philippians, our epistle lesson for today, Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of God. 
Now, this is not to say that we make ourselves worthy of the gospel of God. We could never do that. We are unworthy. No, rather, Christ comes to us with his gospel. And he gives us worth. He makes us worthy of receiving, of being his people. He sets us apart, not for our purposes, but for his. And so God is to be glorified in every aspect of our lives. St. Paul, when he was writing to the Philippians, was in jail. And the Christians in Philippi could easily have been doubting God's work, doubting God's love for them. How could God allow his missionary to be imprisoned? And yet even there it was to his glory. Because the others who were not in prison were more bold in their proclamation of Christ. And Paul was a witness to the imperial guard. That they too were hearing his word and coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Paul talks in such a way that he says that whether he lives or whether he dies, he belongs to the Lord. That is the way of faith in Christ. He says, if I live, it means fruitful labor for me. And it is the same for you. You who have been called by Christ and set apart to his purpose, you are called to fruitful labor, to act in faith toward God and in love to your neighbors. This is God at work in your life. And it is in these things that God is glorified. God is glorified throughout our lives. And finally, because of Christ's saving work, God is even glorified in our death. That our entire life is a testimony to God's saving work. And the promise is that even though I die, yet shall I live. Because Christ, who has died and is risen from the dead, has brought forgiveness for me and for you. And on the last day, he will raise us imperishable. And all the glory belongs to him who has saved us. And so in him, we live and move and have our being. It has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you shall not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. God isn't glorified when everything goes good or according to our plan. God is glorified when his life not just life here, but life eternal, is given and proclaimed to sinners that we might receive life that has no end. And at the end of this life, we will hand it all to him. We will lay our crowns at his throne and say to God alone, be the glory. For in the cross of Christ, I glory, towering o'er the wrecks of time. In Jesus' name, amen.